at a, at a real basic level. And so I, I want to break it down. And uh, for those of you guys that are more technical, I, I definitely appreciate the patience. And for those of you guys that are brand new to the project, I like to try to explain things from the ground up and give you a really solid overview. Uh, so the things that you're familiar with, you know, bear with it a little bit. But those things that are new to you, I want to explain it at a very basic level so that you kind of see what's going on. The idea is when you are configuring an endpoint and asterisk, and an endpoint uh, can be almost anything. It doesn't necessarily need to be a phone. An endpoint could be another server, um, you know, or potentially any other kind of device that you would, you would have a call to going on an endpoint. In this case, we're talking about a phone. It's a DigiMD70 phone. And we want to configure that endpoint. And this is the real basic at a very basic level. In order to configure an endpoint, it's a three-step process. So step one is I need to put a configuration on the endpoint itself. So you can see this is like a configuration file, or it's representing some type of configuration. And I got to put that on. I need to put that on the, uh, the endpoint there. And then I also need to create an account in asterisk. Okay? And the account details in asterisk need to match the account for the endpoint. So if I have like username and password authentication, I need those, those details to match. If it's a SIP account, I need to put it in the SIP configuration, SIP.conf. If it's an EECS account, I need to put it in the EECS configuration, EECS.conf. And then in order to make my phone work, I need to create a dial plan script that is going to call to that phone. So I'll walk through this process now. Like I said, uh, we'll see how far we get and if we will make it to lunch. So first, let's set up an account in asterisk. Okay? Again, if you guys have uh, done this from a GUI before, this is going to be in a text-based configuration file. This is that syntax I showed earlier where uh, we have key value pairs. So this is not quite as complex as a dial plan. The dial plan in extensions.conf is a really a scripting language. In the other .conf files, it's pretty simple, key value pairs. We can see here that in Etsy asterisk, I'm editing sip.conf. Sip.conf, I showed this to you guys earlier, was the file that is going to uh, configure the sip channel driver. And because I have a sip phone, I want my configuration to go in sip.conf. When I configure the account for the phone, the account name will go in brackets. Again, I can name it anything I want. Uh, I can name it you know, Bob's phone, or I can name it account name. It's a good idea to have something good and descriptive. And I'll, uh, I'll talk about account names more in a moment. We also want to have a type. Okay? In this case, it's type equals friend. There's a few different options. I'll show that on the next slide. We have a host setting, host equals dynamic. So the way these key value pairs work is the, the option on the left, you know, that's an option. So I can set host. I could set host to an IP address. I could set host to uh, you know, a host name or a host to dynamic. Again, I'll, I'll, I'll go over more. Here we're setting the context to inside. And we've set a secure SIP secret. So let me talk a little bit more in detail about about these uh, specific configuration files. So first, the account name. If I'm configuring my phones uh, you know, manually or configuring them in a text file, what should I name my phones? Well, a good, there's a couple different theories or philosophies on the name. This. A good option is perhaps MAC address, the MAC address of the phone, right? Uh, this is a great name for a SIP account because you're tying it to the endpoint, and that endpoint is going to use that account. Uh, the place where this might fall down is, let's say, if you have multiple accounts on the phone. So for example, you know, on my uh, D70 here, I've got six different line keys. That could potentially be six different SIP accounts. I can't name them all the MAC address of the phone. But uh, if you uh, read asterisk the definitive guide, and in fact, I should just pop this up now that I've thought of it. Um, let me go to Firefox. OK? And if you just uh, Google for asterisk the definitive guide, and 
Even if you misspell it, I bet you uh, Google will get you there. And Asterisk, the Definitive Guide, is an O'Reilly book uh, that is the definitive guide to Asterisk. So actually, the, uh, all the authors of the book are here at this Astrocon. It's kind of a unique thing. I don't think we've ever had them all here at one time. Um, we'll see if my uh, network connection is going to work, of course, now that I'm on the fly. Uh, it doesn't. But the point is, in, in Asterisk, the definitive guide, you can uh, purchase the book, which I, I recommend to purchase it and support the authors and support that effort. But they also made it freely available. So if you just Google for asterisk the definitive guide, it's available free online, which is really, really nice. The book has come out in you know, several different editions. So the first and the second edition were called asterisk the future of telephony. And then by the third edition, they said, hey, it's already the future. Here we are. So they said they had to change the name, asterisk the definitive guide. Um, again, a lot of the content I'm going through, it goes through in that book and more. And every single asterisk administrator should have a copy. Those of you guys that already have a copy are like, why is he recommending this so much? And the answer is because I meet asterisk administrators all the time. And I say, hey, have you, you, know, you have your copy of Asterisk the Definitive Guide. And actually, some guys are like, no, I haven't seen that book. So I want to make a, a big point to check that out. And if you brought your copy of your book with you or if you have it, all the authors are here, uh, Russell Bryant, Jared Smith, um, Jim Meglin, and uh, who else is on there? Russell. I already said Russell. Who am I missing? Life. Yeah. How can I forget? Life. Life Madsen. So uh, those guys are here, and uh, they wrote the book. So cool guys, my heroes. Uh, in any case, in Asterisk to the Definitive Guide, you will see that they chose MAC addresses to name the phones. And this is a really good name to name a phone if you only want one account per phone. Optionally, if you want to specify multiple accounts per phone, I personally recommend using like a user's name. So just like you might have an email account, and my email account is, is bchia at digium.com, well, a good name for a phone account would be bchia. Uh, that would be a good name for my personal account. And you know, if I have multiple extensions, maybe you can come up with a different naming mechanism. I will uh, offer a word of caution on not naming your devices after the extension number. So, for example, let's say I'm going to write a script, and script 100 is going to call this phone. Uh, what is common practice, you'll see a lot of asterisk documentation out there. And in fact, uh, very popular distributions um, name, their, name their extensions this way, uh, including SwitchFox and FreePBX. When you have an account name, it's account 100. And it's not, it's not horrible. But it's not the most secure. So if you have a premise-based PBX, if you're not exposed to the, to the internet, maybe that's OK. But think about it this way in terms of an attacker coming after your box. right? If someone is going to come after your box, and it's exposed to the public internet, and you're ex you've exposed port 5060, so you have SIP exposed out to the public internet, well, anybody can hammer that port really, really fast you know, um, hundreds or thousands of, of, of registration attempts per second, right? Now, there are some tools to help you combat, combat this, fail to ban, and some other tools. But just, you know, imagine for a moment, what does that attacker need in order to get access to one of your extensions on your PBX and to begin to make calls with that, ex with that or I, I said extension, with that account? What does that attacker need to get access to that SIP account? Well, they need a username and they need a password, right? If you're in a security conscious uh, setting, so for example, you know, if you work for government, or just people seem to be hacking your box more often than others, um, or for whatever reasons, I would probably recommend naming your extensions with some random data. Or I keep saying extensions. Naming your SIP accounts. Naming your SIP accounts with some random data. So for example, maybe my SIP account would be bchia, you know, and then some, ran some string of random data. And the reason I want that random data is because I don't want an attacker coming from the outside. They need to guess two things, the username and the password. I don't want to just give them the username, right? So if all of my SIP accounts are named like 100, 101, 102, it's like you've already given the attacker. They're going to know. They're going to try to bang your box with a script to auto-register those accounts, right? And they're, they're going to keep trying to get one until they get like a failed registration or, or a response back that maybe that is an account that actually exists. And then they're going to try to brute force or dictionary 
or rainbow table your passwords, and then your SIP account is exposed. I, I remember a talk last year at AstroCon. Man, it, it broke my heart. This guy, uh, you can probably find the video on the uh, archive from last year's AstroCon spot. And uh, I think it was in a security talk that Nir Simonovich gave. And you know, this, this guy had, um, had one box, and it was a popular distribution. And his employers did not allow him access to that box. I don't know why you would do this. If we have anybody in here who's not an asterisk person, who's like a, maybe a manager or something, hey, just give them access to the box. And anyway, the point was this box had a known exploit. There was a known patch for the box, but he just wasn't allowed to go and log into that box and fix it. I don't know what the politics there at that situation was. Are you serious? I'm telling your story. Man, that broke my story, man. That, uh, that broke my heart. This is, this is so cool. This is Astrocon, ladies and gentlemen. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll just I'll finish up the story. Well, how much um how much did it cost you to have that attack? One hundred twenty-five thousand. That that's what that's what you guys ended up having to pay. How much was the actual like how much did they rack up? Yeah. So if you if you guys can imagine that just be a known exploit, um you know almost three hundred thousand dollars of of charges were charged up because of, of, being, of having a, a PBX publicly available to the internet and because a known exploit wasn't plugged. Um, and it's tough, and you're on the hook for that, right? Because those calls are, are made to somebody. Somebody's got to pay for them, right? So even though you can try to negotiate that down, that's still like a costly amount. So I, I beg and plead with you. You hear like just it, the passion in my voice. Use unique, uh, you know, SIP account names, and uh, even if, if possible, maybe put some random data after the account names, and use unique SIP passwords for every single SIP account every time. Just get a, a random string generator, generate some long random string passwords. This is going to help you against attack. I mean, you want to do many security things to help mitigate against attack. This is one of your, uh, you know, one of your options that you want to do. So. Hopefully it didn't freak you guys out too much by spending lots of money. There's lots of talks. I recommend hitting the security talks. I think Nir's doing another one again this year. And um, we'll talk more about security as we go along. I hammer on the username and password. Next, let's talk about uh, type equals friend. Okay. Inside of Asterisk, we have basically three different types that an, a SIP account can be. It can be a friend, a user, or a peer. Okay. Uh, I'll talk more in a second about the, the dynamics between those. Um, but basically, you've got a user and you've got a peer. And it says one is for inbound calls and one is for outbound calls. And that's like extremely inaccurate. I don't want to say extremely inaccurate. That's pretty darn inaccurate. Um, the idea is you might want to use it for that. So uh, pretty much the only time you set up a user, an actual type equals user, is you know, maybe when you're only receiving inbound calls. So if you've got some kind of uh, Dundee set up, and uh, Dundee is a, is a kind of distributed numeric querying system to query for numbers. And so maybe an asterisk box queries for your, for your Dundee credentials, and you send out the Dundee credentials. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make an inbound call on a user because it only needs to be inbound. But uh, peers can certainly also receive inbound calls. And I'll, I'll talk about the difference between them in a moment. Uh, we'll talk about that in a sec. Host equals dynamic. Okay. Um, Obviously, you can see here that I can set my host to an explicit IP or an explicit host name. So if I want to communicate to this phone, keep in mind now, if you come from the realm of the telco, if you're, uh, you know, if you're used to analog phones, the only way that Asterisk knows to communicate with that phone is via the network. It's not like a phone. It's a computer. And they're talking over a network. So think about it like this. This is a common problem with SIP phones. I pick up my SIP phone, and I can make a phone call. right? I, I can punch in numbers. I get to my Astra server. It routes calls. That works just fine. When I try to call the phone, I can't call the phone. Now, why would that happen? With a normal, with an analog phone, if I pick up that phone, if I've got dial tone, that means I can call in and I can call out. right? That's not true with a SIP phone. So if you're new to SIP phones, if you're new to VoIP, this is a concept to kind of like cement in your head, is that the SIP phone is a networking device, 
And it's, if you hear dial tone coming out of a SIP phone, that means absolutely nothing. That just means the phone itself is generating to you dial tone. So the idea here is if asterisk, uh, if the phone knows the IP of asterisk, it can route to that IP. That does not mean that asterisk automatically knows the phone's IP. It has to go both ways, right? So there's a couple ways I can tell the asterisk system what the IP of the phone is. I can explicitly define it. So here I've explicitly said 192.168.55.14. That's, that's the uh, explicit IP of that phone. Well, or I could give it like a host name, but that's not very flexible. I mean, I don't want to go and manually assign IPs to all of my phones. Who wants to do that? Especially if you've got 200, 500, 1,000 endpoints. What I really want to do is I want to be able to assign an, NP, uh, an IP to my endpoint using DHCP, so it gets a dynamically generated IP address, but then I, Asterisk needs to know about it somehow, right? This is where you get into SIP registration, okay? The way SIP registration works is when the phone comes online or during a periodic timeout, the phone will send a SIP message to Asterisk, and it's specifically a registration message. And it says, hey, here's my IP address. The way Asterisk knows to listen for that message is when you set host equals dynamic. So basically setting host equals dynamic says, I don't know the IP now, but listen for it. When, when you get it from the phone, associate it with this account. And when the phone registers, it'll say, hey, here's my credentials, here's my username, here's my password, and here's my IP address. Now Asterisk has that IP address. It'll cache it in the SIP peer cache or one of several other things, depending on your configuration. And Asterisk will be able to route to that phone. We had a question. Absolutely. So the question is, is there a way to set up my SIP account so that it only works on a certain network? The answer is yes. Uh, so just like you would have uh, host and context and secret, you have permit and deny. So you can deny all and uh, deny all the other networks, and then specifically permit the networks that you want that, that SIP account to be able to register from. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a good point to mention the sample files. So over in, uh, in my system here, inside of Etsy asterisk, you can see I've got kind of all of these files. And I'll just take a look at one, sip.conf. And I've named it sip.conf.sample. But if, if you're compiling and you run the make samples command, you can get to all of these sample files. They're also available online. Um, and and uh, you can actually find them in the configs subdirectory of your asterisk source. So let me, let me actually go there first. That's probably a better way to do it. So if I go here to uh, user source and uh, I, I look in my source directory, I've got, I've got a, a configs subdirectory, okay? So if I go into the, the configs subdirectory, there are all the sample files. So, um, you know, obviously if I, ha if I have a configuration, I don't want to overwrite it with the samples, but it, they're all there in the source for me to look at. These are a very valuable resource. Let me open up sip.conf.sample, and the idea here is look at all these comments. I mean, this is a whole file just filled with comments telling you what, you know, telling you, uh, for example, here, uh, it's talking about CLI commands, like SIP, 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 the options are in the sample file with a nice comment telling you what they do. So for example, if I look for permit, here I can see that I can restrict uh, at what IPs your users may register their phones. Okay? So here I I'm, I'm, have a contact deny and a contact permit where I can lock down essentially the networks that are allowed to, to register from. And that's some security settings. So in addition to, you know, Resources like today's lecture, in addition to Asterisk the Definitive Guide, in addition to Digium training, like you know, online training Asterisk Essentials or our instructor-led training, the, the sample files are an amazing resource 
that, that give you, you know, a, a wealth of knowledge right there in the sample files. So uh, we talked about essentially host equals dynamic. The phone will register. It'll, it'll save it in the cache, and now Astros can communicate with the phone. The context. The context is extremely important when you are setting the context for an endpoint. If you remember to our discussion of dial plan, uh, dial plan contexts are separate by default. That's good. That's for security. I want my inside context different than my outside context. This is also, for example, if I have an administrator, I have a CEO, or I have uh, somebody who has access to special extensions. So for example, I, want my I might want my call manager to be able to dial an extension and be able to listen to all of her call agents. She could do that with ChanSpy, right? I could set up a script to spy on those channels. I want the manager's phone to be able to access that extension. I do not want everybody else to be able to access that extension. The way you do that is separating them by context, right? Put those extensions in different buckets. So when a phone dials into the dial plan, where does it start? It starts in the configured section. So here I've set context equals inside. That means that when this SIP account is used, when a call comes in from this SIP account, it's going to start in the inside context. And of course, like I said earlier, we could use a go to to go somewhere else after that. But that's going to be the starting context. Uh, a lot of times, this is another troubleshooting me method, right? Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll pick up a phone, and you'll call into an extension. And you believe it's supposed to get one extension, but you're really getting a different one. And the reason is, is because you've misconfigured the context. You've configured it for some other context that you, you didn't uh, want it to be in. And so it's getting the wrong access to the wrong bucket of scripts. Finally, the, uh, the secret is the account password. And uh, like I've said, you really want unique SIP secrets every single time on every account. Um, there's really no reason to do it. I would even recommend it, even if your, your PBX is not exposed to the PSTN. Um, you know, just for the sake of security, or not exposed to the PSTN, not exposed to the public internet. Even if you've closed off the ports, even if you don't uh, have your PBX out on the, out on the public internet, I still, you still want secure SIP secrets. There's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, imagine if you had somebody internal to your company, and like I said, like they, you've got the call manager. You don't want just any random person to be able to use the call manager's account. Well, if you're not using secure SIP secrets, somebody internally could hack that. Or there's lots of other vectors of attack. Your PBX may not uh, be exposed in some way that you think, but maybe you've got some other box, and that other box is a vulnerability. And they've made their way onto your local LAN via some other box that you have exposed that you thought was in the DMZ and really gives you access into the local LAN. And from this other box, now they've got access to your PBX. So secure SIP secrets again and again. And we have another question. Do you have a list of what characters are allowed? Uh, that's an excellent question. Is there a list of what characters are allowed? And uh, I'm pretty sure that that's on the wiki. I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, as you can see, it, it's going to accept you know, your basic ASCII characters. And so I'm, I'm going to say for sure it's going gonna, it's gonna to do numbers, letters, uppercase and lowercase, and uh, symbols, like your basic, your basic symbols. Um, so if you use like a, a, a random password generator script, stick with those characters, and, and you're going to be good to go. Um, I'm pretty sure you could probably find like on, on the wiki or, or um, you know, within, the, within the documentation excluded characters, but that's, that's good thinking. That's what I'm talking about. Some guy's like, how, how much randomness can I throw at this? Can I use obscure characters that people don't even use? That's, that's what I like and get nice and secure. So as promised, I said I'd talk a little bit more about uh, users, peers, and friends and, and some of the technical differences here. OK. So a, uh, a user is essentially for inbound calls only. So you cannot make an outbound call with a SIP account that's configured as a user. It's, it's inbound only. It's, it's a one way. Okay? When the call comes into asterisk, it's going to match on the username uh, in the from header of the SIP packet. Okay? So SIP it stands for Session Initiation Protocol. It is a, uh, you know, it's an application layer protocol. So if you just think through your regular kind of networking stuffs, you know, 
you're going to have a payload, and, and the SIP is going to be inside that payload. It's going to have, you know, TCP headers and IP headers encapsulated on top of that, maybe like a, a MAC address frame. But inside that payload of, of the SIP message, it's going to have regular headers, just like any other kind of internet protocol in the, in the IP stack, right? So within that headers, you've got a lot of different uh, things that, that give you the, the address, the SIP URI, all this. One of those headers is, is the, the from header. And in that from header, it's going to have a, a username and if there's a username in there, when that call comes in, and that is a user account, it's going to match on that username. Okay? A peer, on the other hand, if a call comes in and it matches a peer, it's not going to match on username. It's going to match on IP address. So it's going to look in the from line of the SIP URI, and it's going to look at the IP address that's coming in. So you would say, well, why would you want to do this? Well. Uh, imagine that sometimes you may not want to authenticate uh, inbound calls, right? So in some cases, you might have an ITSP where uh, if you want to send calls to the ITSP, the ITSP will challenge you for authentication. But they say to you, well, I just want to be able to send you calls. Tell me, tell me where you're at. Tell me where you're at. I'll send calls there, and I don't want to be challenged for authentication. So not necessarily all ITSPs work this way, but there are some. And so in that case, you're going to want to accept calls that come from an IP address. Keeping in mind all the security ramifications of that, that's uh, configurable in asterisk as setting a peer, right? When the call comes in, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's no authentication either, it just means it matches the account, right? Um, so when the call comes in, it's first going to look for a username that matches the username. And it's gonna, if, if there is a user or a friend account that matches that, it's going to match that first. If it can't find a username match, then it's going to move and it's going to try to match based on the IP address in the URI. And it's going to look for a SIP peer with that IP address. Okay? So basically, um, a friend, literally in the guts of asterisk, it, there's no such thing as a friend. It just, it just says, give me a user and a peer definition together. Okay? So a friend behaves more like a user. It, uh, it is like a peer because it can make outbound calls. But it's literally defining a user and a peer for the same account internally. That's what, a, that's what a type equals friend does. And so really, we just want to use two of these. Okay. So at a technical level, I've given you some kind of like, and you can also you know, view more documentation on this. If you know for a fact you want to match on username, use a friend. If you know for a fact you want to match on IP address, use a peer. If you're like, yeah, I don't really know. Can you just give me some general guidelines? Okay. Really general guidelines. If you configure a phone, friends are for phones. Okay, so very basic guidelines. Configure a friend as a phone. Peers are for trunks. Okay, so if you're setting up like a trunk, like a SIP trunk, configure it as a peer. If you're configuring a phone, configure it as a friend. Okay, phones definitely have to be friends, uh, and that is because uh, obviously you could have, a, like I said, multiple accounts. So if I've got six accounts on this phone and I'm matching based on IP address, they all have the same IP address. They all come from the same phone. So I have to match based on a username, right? Um, that's not to say that you cannot um, or that you should not configure your trunks as friends. And there are a lot of reasons to do that. So if you, you know, get into the community, there's a lot of discussion on this and how I should configure my peers and friends and trunks and phones. Uh, but you can certainly configure a trunk as type equals friend, and I would just work with your ITSP. You know, typically, if you have an ITSP, a lot of times, like I said, they're running asterisk. And a lot of times, you can say, hey, I'm running asterisk. And they will generate for you a configuration file. They'll say, paste this into your sip.conf. Here's all the options that we want. And a lot of times, your ITSP will do that for you. Um, I'll get into the extension. Let's do two more slides, and then we'll, then we'll break for lunch here. Um, so. Next, we've kind of already seen this. I've, uh, so now I have an account on Asterisk. I've created my SIP account. Asterisk has an account for the phone, but I need a way to dial that account. Well, where did I configure that? Extensions.conf and our dial plan. In fact, by now, this should look very familiar to us. And maybe at the start of the day, you didn't know what that meant. Now, hey, look at this. This looks very simple. Extend equals greater than 6001. At priority one, we use the dial application. And we've passed some arguments. It's technology slash resource. 
In this case, it's the SIP channel. And I've given the, the name device name. So I certainly could have a SIP account called device name. But again, we talked about device naming. It could be MAC address, or it could be a person's name, or some random, random data, too, uh, that I would, I would post pen. And then you see the comma here, and those are some options. So comma, and then I've specified a timeout. That means I'm going to ring that phone for 20 seconds before I move on to the next priority or before I end the call. In this case, it's, there's only a one, one priority extension. Um, if I omit the timeout, then it basically rings the phone indefinitely. Like I think there's a timeout, but it's like you know 100,000 years. <laughs> It'll ring the phone for. So uh, in this case, it's going to ring the phone for 20 seconds before it before it moves on. So this should look real simple to us. Hey, we've got an extension. Okay. Now this sh should make a little bit more sense. So I what I'll do is I'll I'll cover the actual endpoint configuration in, in DPMA specifically. I'll cover that after lunch. But imagine for a moment that I've configured the phone with its account credentials as well. So I've got an account in asterisk, and the phone also knows its account credentials, and so now it can make calls. What actually happens? What's the, the call flow? Okay? This is the flow of a call in asterisk. What happens here is imagine that David picks up his phone and hits the DTMF keys 200. Okay? Now, I, I need to make a note that this diagram here is abstracted from reality. This is, this is not how asterisk works. So it makes it look like when David dials 200 in the asterisk, that asterisk on the fly looks at sip.com. Right? I've already said this is not the case. Right? What does asterisk actually do? When does it look at sip.com? When I load the module. Right? So it only looks at text, that text file when that configuration is read, when I specifically reload the module and say, read that configuration. So I'm, I'm extracting from reality. It doesn't actually look at sip.conf on the fly. What it does is it looks at a cache of sip.conf from the last time that configuration file was read. Right? So now that we're clear, it goes into the cache of sip.conf. And in this case, the phone has been configured with the sip account, David. And so in the cache, it says, oh, I have an account for David. Right? That account is a type equals friend, and so it's matched on username. And it has a host equals dynamic, and it has a SIP secret. In this case, it's a super insecure <laughs> secret equals password. Um, but that phone, is to make that call, has authenticated with those credentials. The SIP uh, channel driver has uh, challenged it and give it a 401 unauthorized, and it's, it's responded with the authentication credentials and says, yes, I'd like to make this call. So, where is it going to start in the dial plan? Well, it's going to start in the inside context, because that's the context configured for that SIP account. It moves into the inside context, and then it starts looking for an extension. In this case, extension 200, because that's the digits that were sent. It says, hey, I want extension 200. When it finds extension 200, it's going to execute that extension. In this case, extension 200 is a one priority extension, it uses a dial application, and it dials a SIP account called Kenny. So uh, it goes from the cache of extensions.conf, it executes that extension, which then goes and looks and again in the cache of SIP.conf to say, hey, do I have an account called Kenny? It does, in fact, have a, a SIP account called Kenny, and it needs to be a type equals friend or a type equals peer. So with type equals friend, I can dial type equals friend Kenny or type equals peer Kenny, so I can send calls to a peer. Remember, if the Kenny account is a type equals user, then I cannot dial that from a dial statement. Right? Users is only for inbound calls. In this case, the Kenny account is a type equals friend. In this case, the host is uh, manually configured, uh, 192.168.101.35. And so it sends the call to that IP address over the network. And that's the basic call. So Again, having this kind of picture in mind, it helps us to troubleshoot. So for example, if at any, any point in the chain here, if something is broken, I know which steps to look at. Uh, for example, if I, if I didn't get to the right extension, well, maybe my account for David is configured with the wrong context. right? If uh, my phone can't make calls, maybe my account for David has the wrong authentication credentials. right? If my uh, call is not going to Kenny, maybe I've set the wrong type. Or 
Maybe I've set host equals dynamic and Kenny's phone hasn't registered. This is a super, super common uh, problem to deal with is I'm trying to make a call out to Kenny's phone, but Kenny's phone hasn't registered. And I can do SIP show peers to see if that registration is. So I think it is now about 12.17. We can, uh, we can break for lunch. Thank <music> you.